Hello everyone, welcome to the AOI Streams, in-depth conversations with digital artists and experts to explore how blockchain technology is impacting the future of art. AOI, also known as Art on Internet, is the movement for emerging arts and technology. I'm Federica and today I'll be your host. In today's Inner Code Masterclass, we invite the incredible generative artist Melissa Wiederrecht to walk us through her journey, creative career and live demo of her generative art process. Point, like at some point, um, I don't even remember what year, but at one point I actually, I found this book. I brought it for this occasion to show you. This is what inspired me originally to get into generative art. Um, so I started playing with, with Flash and Action Script, but then I did a lot of painting back then as well. And then I actually didn't do any art for a good probably 10 years while I was at university. Um, and then I got back into it after, and I've been working really hard on it since, basically. That's awesome. And so when did you start learning about genetic art? How did that come to your life? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I kind of always was, even before I learned to code, I was kind of doing generative processes, like by hand, and I'll show you in my presentation what I used to do. But, um, and, and then like by hand on paper, and then when I learned Photoshop, I was kind of doing generative processes in Photoshop. I like would have a, a process I would follow and like a set of rules and I would do it over and over and over and introduce randomness and stuff. And then, so when I, when I discovered Flash and Action Script and this book that I just showed you, it was like, super amazing, exciting aha moment for me. And I just kind of never looked back. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so throughout the years, um, you're going to show us, you know, some inspirations and some of the works, but why do you think that Gerenty Art became your, let's say, preferred art medium right now? And what does coding have that other art mediums don't have? So I love that generative art has randomness. Like I can, I can define a system that has randomness so that the artwork can even surprise me, the artist. And also I really love that I can define a system that can generate more than one output. Like back, way back when, when I used to work with like actual paint and stuff, I would take months and months and months to make a single artwork. I was just so perfectionistic. But um, when I switched to doing with code, First of all, I, I'm not near so perfectionistic anymore. I don't know why, um, it's just true. But also I can I can make like thousands of outputs and then I can pick the ones I like. Um, yeah. Do you think that, I love that do you think that um, generative art was, you know, one of the reasons why you became a little less perfectionist? Cause now you're saying, you know, you're not like that anymore. And I feel like generative art really pushes your all your strength if you're a perfectionist because you really have always this this um element of chance that you can't really control and so if you are a perfectionist it can be a little triggering right so do you think no, that it was blame the chance. Of, uh, it's not my fault anymore <laughs> <laughs> something is wrong the computer did it right <laughs> <laughs> yeah right you, you could also use that yeah sorry sorry to interrupt you about that um and so what we're saying is, um, you know, you've also been exploring this for such a long time. So what has excited you about generative art throughout these years um, that you were like, wow, this is, you know, this is really changing the way generative art is seen and perceived as well. You mean is it, perceived in general or for me? Yeah, do you, you think like maybe, I don't know, maybe in the NFT space uh, was a big turnout oh. or also like um seeing genetic art exhibited in galleries for example was this something that you were like super excited about throughout this like 20 years of you like exploring genetic art yeah no the nft space is absolutely life-changing for me like i've been doing generative art forever but like the best i could say is that i posted it on instagram <laughs> and some people liked it and that was about it until um 2019 i started making generative art and selling it on shutterstock even then, like I was making a tiny bit of money, but like nobody cared that it was generative art. Like I could make the most beautiful thing on the planet and nobody cares. But all of a sudden people really care. And it's just completely life-changing for a generative artist, honestly. So. Mm. No, absolutely. And also I saw that you use some of the, um, a part of your sales 
to uh, build an amazing project like a school in Sudan. Tell us about this. It's so exciting. Yeah, actually, I haven't announced it yet, but it actually just finished. Um, I'm going to go nice. visit and take pictures. Yeah. Um, so, but for my Art Blocks curated project, Sudfa, I took 25% of the proceeds, which turned out to be about $100,000. Rounded it up to $100,000. And I went to Sudan with my family and we, you know, got the, the process started and they've built a school. It's small, but it's awesome. And the community is absolutely in love with it. So really exciting. That's awesome. Do you have any like pictures they can show to us? Yeah, uh, let me pull it up. Can you see that? Yeah. So um, these pictures at the top are before we built a school. This is what it looked like <clears throat> in the same location. They had a, um, just like a hut that they built by hand. And it's got like, you know, no windows and no proper roof and stuff. Mm. One of the classrooms was outside. This is a chalkboard on the wall outside. So um, that was back in August. And now I've got these pictures at the bottom. This is the new school, what it looks like on the outside. Oh, it's got three so classrooms cool. and an office. So, unofficial That's announcement. I haven't announced yet that it's We have the exclusive for this. I love it. I love it. We were able to, to be the first ones to know. <laughs> Everyone uh, who's in the channel just now, please share your reactions about this in the chat in our channel. Send us some love and let us know if you if you love this project. It's absolutely incredible what NFTs can really do. I'll always see some uh, really great reactions. <laughs> Okay, and since uh, since we're here, we're talking about you know the the power of your art and what you were able to achieve not just within the empty space but also outside. Um, why don't you start sharing your screen and walk us through your journey and your career? So I prepared this presentation um, going way way back in high school. I used to do these things on hand by paper. You can see my high school notebook paper here. And it was really kind of a generative process that I used to do by hand. So I would take coins, like, you know, pennies and nickels and dimes and different sizes, and I would align them up in a circle. Um, and then I would just keep picking a different random coin and then align it against two other coins and go all the way around. It's kind of hard for you to understand without a demonstration, but just believe me. I would align it to two other coins and I do the same thing all the way around and then I do it again I pick two other circles that have been drawn and trace it touching those and then I would erase random places and fill it with patterns and stuff so it was I mean it, it sounds funny to a lot of people that I would be doing generative art by hand because generative art is usually code but the point is that it was a set of rules and a process that I would follow over and over and over and then you get completely different outputs depending on what coin you choose and what you choose to line it up to and stuff. So that was like very early generative art. And then the first thing I could find that I still have that I made as generative art, actual code, 2004-ish. So, I mean, that's a guess. I don't know exactly, but it was sometime during high school. I made this guy with flash and I was really playing with, um, there, there's a bunch of pieces here. Okay, looks like a dot and a line. They're all the same, except that I gave them each a different, a different rotation speed. And I was just so fascinated with how they would line up and unalign and arrange in different formations and whatnot. So yeah, that's the first thing that I have. Still have it amazingly. So then, um, Still back in high school, I was really, really into painting. And I, you have to go back to high school to find paintings for me because I really haven't been doing painting since. But this is what I made. These are oil paintings, these two. And this is a watercolor, which this one I, actually kind of fascinates me looking back at it because I feel like some of my way more recent works, um, like in the last couple of months, kind of remind me of this. Yes, absolutely. I was just thinking of that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I thought like you might think that if you saw that and then that other one <laughs> later, I'll show it later. It's kind of similar, it's kind of funny. 
Okay, so this was high school, literally. And then I went to college. I went and I studied computer science and I didn't do any art. From 2006, almost until I graduated in, what did I graduate in? 2014, 15, somewhere around there with a master's, except I made this one sometime randomly during my college years. But other than that, I didn't do any art. But then after I graduated, I was like, yay, time to do generative art again. So I learned processing and I started making these animations, which are so similar actually to what I used to make back in high school. Like I rotated things at different speeds and whatnot. I just kind of started with what I knew again. Uh, I can totally see the reference to what you were doing in high school. I love it. I love to see the evolution of that. It's beautiful. Always for, for a while, I just kept doing the same thing of making things rotate at like every, every, every piece of it rotated at a different speed, if that makes sense. Even this one. Um, if you guys want to see my old Instagram account, I can post it. No, I can't post it. I'm not in the Discord. It's Ninja Code Artist was my old Discord. Oh, all right. I will share it right now on my Discord. Old, um, Instagram. And I tried to make in classes. <laughs> Don't go watch them. They're not that great, but they're there. They're on Skillshare. So that's what I was trying to do first to make a living as a generative artist. I was making classes. So then um, in 2018, I discovered surface pattern design and digital painting. Um, I got an iPad with the Apple Pencil and I just started painting away like I used to paint back in high school. So I painted, you know, the tea that we were drinking one day and I painted a lot more flowers. Um, these ones are funny for me to look at now. I'm gonna make it bigger so you can see closer if I can. Because um, a lot of my work has like scribbles and stuff all over it. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's a theme, apparently. I love scribbles. Yeah, I haven't seen those in a while. Um, so surface pattern design, if you don't know what it is, it means making seamless patterns that they put on, you know, clothing or, you know, pillows, wallpaper, sheets, anything where you would print a pattern on things. So I made lots of patterns. And at this point I was making them by hand. So like this pattern, I put it on the dress as an example. Um, and then in 2019, I started trying to make them with code and I wasn't that good yet, but I was, um, I was aiming to make vector graphics to sell on sites like Shutterstock. So these are all vector code, vector, vector images that I made with code using processing back in 2019. And then in 2020 and 2021, I kept making surface patterns and I started going crazy with the code and the generic processes. So everything that you see here, plus 33,000 more designs I made with like generative processes and code. Not all pure code, but almost everything I made had some sort of generative process in it. Um, you can see back then I was playing with like brush strokes on a flow field, which comes back later. Some of you know that. More brush strokes on a flow field. Uh, this is an early version of orbs that I made back in 2020. I made tie dye generatively. You can see it. Um, and I thought at this point I'd actually show you one of the things I used to do. Um, I did use actual code, but I also back at that point I used to play with um, Substance Designer because everything it makes is a seamless pattern. So, uh, and also because the way you work in here is very much like the same, same thought process as generative art. Like it's just as if I'm writing code without writing code, if that makes sense. So like um, at the end of this thing, you can see what this makes. It makes kind of like a strippy tie-dye pattern. 
And so like I would import a color scheme and then choose random colors from it and make these stripes and stick them on a, it would just like throw them together randomly with that thing, blur them. Um, uh, it was in Substance Designer that I learned to use something called a variable blur, which is like really important for my, my, my recent work. What it means is that you give it a map um, and wherever it's dark, it doesn't use any blur. See how it's kind of not as blurred there. And wherever it's white, it uses more blur and like everywhere in between, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I didn't know about this, um, the software specifically. I've never used it myself. It's, it's I think just... most people haven't, but I found it really funny. Actually, William Mappan said he used to use it too. Oh, and I, I think that actually having used this software a long time is like so important for the way that I think now in generative art. Mm. Um, just like the Why process, and the, the things you can do. Like I learned like, you know, about the variable blur and like, how important the different types of noise are and how they affect things. Warping, mm -hmm. like the effect of warping your, um, here's an example right here. Is this Given something that you would um, then advise and, and uh, suggest to our emerging artists to, to start using? Yeah, like if I was gonna teach, I don't know, a university course or something on generative art and try to get people to really think like, the way I do anyway. I mean, generative artists have a lot of different ways of thinking, right? But if I was gonna teach the way I do things, I would totally go in and have people play with substance mm -hmm. designer. And then I would try to explain to them how to transfer it over to code. Because you can, everything you do in here, you can do exactly in code as well. All right. Some way of thinking. Like, so like in code, I would literally, I would make this noise and then I would take this and I would warp it which is what mm -hmm. this does. It warps this image based on this and becomes that, if that makes sense. That's awesome. Think, Definitely, like anyone who's in the audience who's a generative emerging artist and you know, you're know you learning, or if you do something else, some other type of art and you're like, you know what, I want to give it a try, you know, start with this and see, see what comes out. And uh, that's a really great advice. I think I'm going to I'm gonna do it myself. <laughs> I think I'm gonna do a little bit. <laughs> it's super fun, but having tried to teach somebody before, like I don't know, it still is an interesting way of thinking. But if you can get it, um, yeah, I think it's majorly, majorly important and helpful for doing generative art to be able to think like this. I guess, like the to be able to think in a process and to know what are the things you can do and how they work. So, um, like. I have warps in here and then I blend things with like the light mode. It has all the blending modes, just like Photoshop, if anybody's familiar with those. Um, you multiply, screen, those are very Photoshop-y things to do, but you can do them in here as well. Um, so at the end, I have a random tie dye and here's the coolest part. If I change the random seed, wait for it for a minute, Wait a second you get a completely different output. So then what I would do is I would make these graphs and then I would, I had a custom Python script that would run it however many times, like 100, 200, 1000 times and give me a bunch of different outputs. So the set that I made from this particular one is here. Um, and you can see kind of the variation of what you would get. So you could say like even before NFT that I was kind of making long form collections <laughs> with this. Um, I had another one as well. I'll show you really fast. Maybe. Oh, sorry, this one. So, um, and this one, I have actually two graphs. First, I take a rectangle and I warp it and then I warp it some more and then I warp it some more and then I warp it some more and put a gradient on top of it. 
and output it. And then I stick that one six times into here with different random seeds. So you get a different mountain and then put them into a, it's called a tile generator. It just makes a bunch of whatever you put in it, arranged however you want. It could be in a grid or it could be just rows or whatever. And then I warp it and warp it and warp it and warp it some more. Um, and then I colorized it with a gradient map and overlaid it with a, actually a real cork board texture, like from real life. And then overlay a picture on, or a color on it, and that's the output. So I would just, um, again, I would run this thing with a Python script and give it thousands of different random seeds. And, and, and you you imported something that you 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 photographed yourself, or that you had, you know, found somewhere for the the core texture. texture. Yeah, I scanned it. I just had. You know, like those those cardboard things that come on the back of a picture frame or whatever. I stick it in my scanner. Amazing. <laughs> and then I turned it into a seamless pattern because it that that's the thing about a substance designer. Everything that comes out of it is seamless. Um, meaning you can put a copy of it next to itself and there's no line. Do you understand? Um, so I had to make that seamless, but then I it's I just imported it and overlaid it on it. So outputted a bunch of those, and that would be my collection that I uploaded and tried to sell. With very minimal luck, I must say. I made really cool things that nobody cared about at this point in my life, which is kind of sad. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, lots of cool stuff. I played with watercolor. Um, for this one, I did random circles thrown around of color, and then I used variable blur to make it kind of bleed out. And then I overlaid on top of it a real life watercolor texture. Um, I have a question from the audience. Someone was asking, um, what are your challenges? And I believe like we can um, apply this to this time of your, of your career and your um, artistic practice. What were your challenges uh, back then? Why you were creating all of this or why you were learning about this? Well, the obvious one is getting anyone to care, I guess, at this point. <laughs> I was trying to sell it on Shutterstock. That wasn't working. I tried to make classes and that didn't work. I tried to put my patterns on notebooks and sell them on Amazon. Oh, that that's didn't okay. work. <laughs> I love them. Nobody cared. So yeah, I mean, that was my huge challenge. Like, I just couldn't figure out how to make a living as a generative artist back then. In Early 2022, I actually switched back because I learned about the NFT space and I was really excited. I wanted to do art blocks. And so I thought, okay, I wanna take everything I've learned with the substance designer and with real life painting. And I really want to try to do it in pure code. So I taught myself shaders. These are some of the first things that I made. Um, yeah. And then I learned about NFTs. And my first drop was actually in May. So not very long ago. It's only been like five or six months. This is called Untitled. It was on FX Hash. And then I dropped Marvel Opulence on FX Hash, also in May. Still in May, I dropped Shulk. These are all pure code now. These are all made with just JavaScript and shader language. And then I made orbs, which as I, as I showed you before, I had an early version of it that was actually in Substance Designer. And then I remade it in JavaScript so that I could drop it on FX hash. And then finally, um, I finally got to be on Artblocks with Sudfa. It was a curated project. Um, I have a link here to show kind of my process, but I thought I'd leave that for later when I'm going to show the code of something. Mm -hmm. I made Solitude. It's one of my favorites to this day. I just love the, the colorful land and everything. It's incredible. It's so like, it, um, almost like melancholic somehow. It's incredibly beautiful. Yeah, I love it. 
anyway. and it's 100 percent generative i mean it, yeah. it just amazes me every single 100%. time it's amazing. just amazing actually i mean if we have time i could even pull it out and show you how it works oh i have an article about it let me pull that up so i can show you really quick um it's an FX hash article. So in the meantime, if anyone from the audience has any questions, please leave them on our chat. So we'll be able to read them out for you. Uh, we, we have a question from Jen's last question. Do you have a background as a developer outside of the art space? Not officially. I mean, I have a master's in computer science. And then I became certified as a machine learning engineer, but I've never gotten a real job. I, after college, I just kind of wanted to make art. So I never got a real job. So I'm going to go with no, not exactly. Um, so yeah, the process was solitude. I pick some random colors and then drop a rectangle in the bottom and then drop a bunch of really squashed circles circles, ellipses, randomly in that area. And then in a shader, I warp it. And then I make some noise that looks like this in a shader. It's like streaky and kind of blobby at the same time. And I use that to blur using that variable blur like I talked about in Substance Designer. I blur it with that. Um, and then I put this texture, which is also kind of a noise. It's like vertical stripy noise and horizontal stripy noise, if you can see it. That's been worked. And I overlay it on top. Um, <clears throat> so underneath that shader layer now, I've also dropped in a tannish ellipses as well. And then I dropped in little triangles. They're literally just triangles that I dropped in underneath. Um, and a sun. That's like the whole thing. I mean, it's kind of simple, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. The magic is in the shader. It really is. And this bit right here. I warp it and I variable blur it and overlay it with the texture. If I didn't do that, it would just look like a bunch of ellipses thrown around it's like kind of stupid um yeah that's solitude spaghetti was my 12 hour speed run that i did on twitter in august um so like with spaghetti i kind of just split the screen diagonally right and threw down a color here and a color here and then i drew squiggles going out, right? And then I overlaid a texture on it. And then I, again, used a variable blur on top to make it kind of blend and look like it's painterly, I guess. And then I made Take Root in September. I, I put up a thread actually with you guys kind of explaining how this works, but it's all made of ellipses and variable blurs. I just threw a bunch of tiny little ellipses down here on the ground bigger ones in the background kind of arranged neatly with you know a focal point of white and I blurred the heck out of it way more in the background and then just like gradually less towards here and gradually more it's all variable blur I love I love variable blur for like everything um and then I made take wing which I'm going to be showing a little bit of the code of in a little bit um, and Sandalia was my last drop that I've ever dropped. That was on Artblocks last month. And then I put in here some of my works in progress. Um, this is the flower that I was referring to that kind of reminds me of what I made back here. It's, I took the code of take wing and then I turned the brush strokes to all go kind of like, you know, radially like a sun. And I added in kind of some weed foliage and then I drew these, these flowers with code. So there's that. And then I've been working on this project. It's also not done and I don't have a name for it. But the idea I was trying to play with here is making brush strokes that would actually, uh, you know, smudge what was under them instead of just throwing a brush stroke on like I do in Take Wing. And Take Wing, they're just like 
kablam, like opaque blush brush stroke. But here I was really trying to play with um, smudging. So that one's not done. I still need to like add a ton of variation and whatnot and then figure out where I'm dropping it. Um, I've also been working on this. It doesn't have a name or anything, but I thought I'd show it. And then the very last thing I've been working on the last couple of days, I've been actually exploring texture because one of my favorite things when I was using Substance Designer is these nodes, these noises that they give you. Grungy noises. Oh, they have new ones. I've never even seen this, but they're so good and they're just so useful. And so I wanted lots of stuff like that to use in my code. So I've been playing with generating textures. But I feel like they could be pieces in themselves, you know? I mean, they're, they're, um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, completely. Mine? Like exploring, yeah, exploring too. your, because you're very colorful, you know? So to see you work in black and white is, is fascinating. And I, I, I would be super interested to see like how far you can uh, push your color into the black and white, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Push color into it? <laughs> yeah, like in the sense that that you can probably create shades and, and, and textures that almost give you the, you know, when you, when you, when we think of, maybe not all, not all of you in the audience, but when I think back, back, back in the day when I was very small and there was still black and white TV, right? I think we had one of the last ones where there was like one channel was black and white. I don't, I can't remember. Or black and white movies. You project color onto it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I feel like I want to project color onto it because I'm so used to seeing color with you that now I see these and I'm like, oh, wow. I, I kind of see color without there being any. So I, I don't know. I thought, I thought that was yeah, there's not even grayscale in here. If you look close, I made it completely. It's just black and white. Amazing. Black Literally white. just black and white. Amazing. Okay, wow. Okay. Yep, only black and white. Just kind of dithered out. Yeah, fun experiment I've been working on. Now, Steve in the audience would love to hear a little bit more about Take Wing. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to actually pull out the code here in a little bit after I've done my presentation. Um, unless you had a specific question about it that's not like the code. You can ask that. So you guys asked me to share some of my inspirations over the years. Major, major one for me since way back in the day, since I ever first learned about generative art is Jared Tarbell. And actually, you can totally see it now, right? Like I kind of made something similar. Absolutely. But I've loved Sandstroke since forever. Oh. Because like he showed that, I mean, generative art doesn't have to just be like so digital and so, you know, the plain old shapes that come with processing. You can do really intricate and really subtle and visually pleasing things with it. So I absolutely love his work. And also Tyler Hobbs. Back when I was just starting, starting again with generative art, I was really inspired by his work, mostly like how he could make brush strokes. Like, as far as I knew at the time, all I could make with processing is just like, you know, a line. But he was making, I keep failing to enlarge this. He was making brush strokes that were really, really amazing and gorgeous and detailed. And I was like, so inspired. And I wanted to figure out how to do that. Um, here's, I found this as I was looking at his stuff. Me, back in 2019 saying, wow. <laughs> to his work. I still think, wow, it's, it's super amazing. <laughs> oh. Okay, so here's another, this is not generative art. This is actual painting. This is actually the painting hanging over my bed right over there. And I find it so inspiring. Um, I just absolutely love how it's like, you know, blurred kind of around the edges and then sharp and so colorful. I just absolutely love this piece. And then finally, I'm always inspired by hotel room art and hotel lobby art and doctor's office art. It's like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> so these are all pictures I took recently as I was like running through a hallway to get somewhere. And I'm like, wait, 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 picture. I love this art. So yeah, those are what I love and I'm inspired by. 
I would say um, keep the, the screen sharing like this if you would like to. Um, there was a couple of things that I was thinking um, that you can, you know, definitely see the organic part of your work. And especially when you are showing us um, uh, sand and sand strokes, I can, I can totally see sand in all of your work. There's almost this um, blurred and also like foggy kind of vision uh, that I see in your work that it gives me also um, a sense of a feeling of, of peace as well. It's like, it's, it's very like visually relaxing, I think. Um, and so also the other thing um, that I wanted to comment on is you were talking about how you create all of these patterns and, and you work with textures. And before you were telling us, you took like this cardboard, and, like scanned it. Um, and so I was wondering, did you also kind of explore the textile um, art or if you haven't been interested in that at all or? You mean like as an inspiration? Um, even like, you know, you were saying before you were doing patterns that could be used for like clothes or, or stuff like that. So were you also interested in that yourself or um, like to make it as well? Like were you in um, or have you ever been interested in the textile art as well? Um, I'm a little confused about what you mean, because I mean, all of this, as far as I know, kind of is textile art, right? Like it's meant to be printed on textiles mm -hmm. or on mm -hmm. surfaces of any type. Um, if you mean like hand making textiles, I've never really done that, mm -hmm. but I've yeah, kind okay. of started it in different ways. Yeah, that's kind of what I was asking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I haven't actually. See, the, the thing is, I hate tedium. <laughs> So, like, one of the reasons I do generative art is just, like, I don't want to do it by hand. I want to make the computer do it for me. Yeah, so. That makes sense. That makes so much sense. <laughs> I just like to make the computer do it for me, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, we have, uh, well, we have a lot of comments. People are super happy about uh, what you're presenting. Everyone is really loving it. So uh, we had some questions before. Someone was asking about showing us how you made uh, take win. So why don't we start with the coding part of the session? Okay, should I jump into take wing first or should I open some fun? Um, let's, go with, let's go with take wing first because uh, we were asked for that, but then we can also jump on Sutta later if that's okay. Okay, so here's my code. Um, I, I always have the code open on one side of the screen and the output on the other. And I can be found hitting refresh constantly. And I'm sure you all understand this, but like every single one of these is a brand new unique output that I've never seen before and nobody's ever seen before and nobody ever will see again. And it's all based on a hash, which is like a random number, basically. And if you give the code the same random number, you'll get the same output. And if you give it a different random number, you'll get a different output. So I actually saved some good hashes here that I wanted to stick it on so that I can show you the different pieces of how this is made. Um, I put this, this random number, the hash, up here. It'll give me that output, and it'll give me that every time I refresh it. So um, this is all just kind of setting up like the canvas and stuff, setting up my random functions. Here I picked a color palette. The number of colors is a random number between one and six. It could have either one color or five colors or anyone anywhere in between. Um, and then I always add in black and white. They're not pure black and white. They're like almost black and almost white. Um, that's all just kind of some canvas set up. This is my glob of shader functions that I use in like all my projects. It's got a blur in here. That's my blur. It's got some noise functions somewhere around here. They're all, I squish them together like this to make my code smaller because when I upload it, to the blockchain, it needs to be really small. And then since I don't really change my functions, I don't really open it back up. But I have a levels function, I have threshold, I have saturation, um, blend with the screen blending mode. 
and I have multiply. It's blend with the multiply blending mode. It's somewhere, oh, overlay. I use blend screen and overlay blending modes constantly. Um, crackle noise, smooth noise. I think that's basically it, what's in here. So, okay, so how this thing works, let me comment out a bunch of stuff. Um, the first thing I do right here is I pick a focal point. So it'll be either one third of the way across or two thirds of the way across and either one third of the way down or two thirds of the way down. So it's gonna be in one of these corners, roughly a third of the way in one of these directions. So I just save those in these two variables to use later. And then I'm trying to remember this is FX hash. So this is, yeah, okay. <laughs> Very basic beginning. I threw down some random colors on the corners and a circle. I think this part was like part of my original thought process. I think by the end of the thing, you don't see any of it. I probably, I could probably just like, get rid of that and you wouldn't notice a difference, but it's there. So then I repeatedly 500 times, pick a random color out of my colors that I picked earlier, wherever that was, out of my color palette. So I've already chosen a color palette for this piece up there. I pick a random color and I drop down a circle in a random place 500 times. And it looks like I gotta do this after. It's like that. Um, okay, then I start using a shader already. And what I do is I blur the thing. I blur it more, it's a, it's a variable blur, just like I keep saying I love so much. I blur a lot out here and not very much towards the focal point. The idea being that I want high contrast right at the focal point and I want really low contrast away from it. And then I have this code here, which is a little bit long, but it makes brush strokes. So this is the size of the thing. Um, so the width divided by three, and then the width divided by three times four. So it's like it's like a small section of the screen. It's the size of my brush stroke. Um, so 800 times <laughs> I make a brush stroke and it picks a completely random location on the on the screen. And it picks a color off of that spot. So it looks at this image that's been blurred and it just picks the color from that spot. So the, the brush strokes in here, they're gonna be really um, sharply different from each other, right? If it picks one here, it's pure white. If it picks one here, it's pure black. Over here, they're all gonna be basically the same color. Kind of a really, really muddy color. Um, so it picks the color from there and it passes it complicatedly in a way I don't wanna explain really into my shader. And the shader makes a brush stroke. It's a combination of noises. Um, I wanna see if there's a good way for me to explain it really. But so if you imagine one of these brush strokes, okay? And I don't know if you remember that noise. This is what noise is. Do you remember the noise over here? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Pick up curling noise. Here we go. Curling noise. Mine is actually not quite curling noise, but that's okay. Um, so I have a noise. And then I squish it. So you end up with really streaky, streakiness. And then I overlay it with like a, a shape that's lighter in the center and darker on the outside. And it kind of this is really hard to explain, but it's a bunch of noises overlaid to make the shape of this brush stroke. And then I color it with whatever color was under it and that original image. If that it, is, it, it definitely does. If anyone has any question about it, 
um, let us know if uh, it's clear enough. It is clear to me right now. I find it incredibly interesting. And also, I was going to ask you, um, when it comes to this, um, the fact that you like, you were saying before, like, um, the part on the outside could be a little bit more blurred and then focusing on a focal point. Um, it does remind me a little bit of, um, you know, focusing with the with the camera, with the photography, right? So do you have any, have you ever uh, explored photography? Is this something that interests you? No. <laughs> I haven't really. Well, I mean, I, I played with it. I took some people's senior pictures back in the day, but not like, I don't know anything really about photography at all, but I do love like the depth of field effect. I just love that. But I like to pretend and code. I don't really know how to make it for real. I've never even done 3D, so I can't make it for real, but someday. But for now, I just like pretend. <laughs> I do fake them the field. <laughs> um, oh, also while the rest tricks are going, 10% um, of the time after it draws a brush stroke, it makes one of these swirly things coming out from the focal point, if that makes sense. It's just, um, those are just like a bunch of circles all lined up going in circles, circles going in circles, if that makes sense. And then on top, I always throw some textures. So this one is a lot of my recent pieces. I have these really intricate lines that you can see if you zoom in really close. Um, it's actually kind of hard to see in this one. If I open this though, no, let me save it. I look really closely here. You can see all these um, lines going all over the place. You see that? Um, that is literally made by throwing lines all over the place. So I just put a mid-tone gray background and then I threw a thousand lines of random, random grays all over the place. And then I overlay this thing on top in my shader along with some other textures. Um, that same texture that I showed in, what's it called, in Solitude? this kind of streaky texture. It's also the background in Sudfall, wherever that is, where's Sudfall? Ah, there it is. Um, if you look really close with these lines that are kind of warped, I tend to throw that same texture on top of a lot of different things. So it's in here as well. Um, you can kind of see it, see these lines going this way that are warped. And they're going this way as well. So I just, I throw these textures on top with blending modes and always the textures, they really tie it together for me. I just love texture and I can't stop using texture. So yeah, I mean, that kind of sums it up. I mean, it's really high level. It's not very detailed, but that's how that one works. That makes sense. That's awesome. No, that's absolutely beautiful. And thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, Samuel is asking if you can use these codes to paint realism. And this kind of reminded me of um, one of your last works. Is it Roots? Is it? Take Root? Yeah, because I believe this is what um, Samuel is trying to ask. Uh, Samuel, please expand on that as well, if you can, um, on what you, what you mean specifically. but. Um, I'm imagining they mean like to make like a neat like oil painting type of thing with these brush strokes, which I'd like to try, but it's actually kind of hard. Like here, I don't have any brush strokes. I was kind of trying to sort of go for realism, but I'd like to try to do kind of realistic paintings. The hard part is like, imagine if you're painting, you like, you need to get the, the brush strokes to curve around the edges, which I don't know how to do, but I know it can mm -hmm. be done. <laughs> because of what Peter Pasma does with his lines. He makes them go uh, like around the, around his shapes and stuff. So I know it could be done. Someday I'll figure it out. But for now, 
I don't know how. Like you wouldn't <laughs> want to just have all your lines go in the same direction, right? Like you would want them to curve with the shape and mm -hmm. so, that makes sense. So I don't know how yet. But Work in progress. In the future. <laughs> Okay, I think that someone is also okay. Someone says that you answered the question. That's perfect. That's what he was. He was uh, trying to understand. Um, some reactions from the audience. Someone is saying you were inspiring, inspiring a lot. So that's pretty beautiful. Um, Surfa is one of the works that I, I think I, I got to know your work for, and it's it's really incredible. I've been such a fan of it. It's uh, and I would love to know how you made it. Like I, after all that you just showed us, I, I really want to know how that happened. <laughs> okay, well I'm gonna try to explain it. So again, they're all random. Everything you see is like never been seen before, and never will be seen again but they're defined by a very specific process. So um, again, I saved some specific hashes that I wanna show you. And as long as it keeps this hash built in, it'll always give me the same image. So I'm going to back it up to, okay, so like some, some similar stuff. I have my list of colors up here that I use. Um, for soot, I just choose two colors. And I always have a gradient. It's really subtle here. It's like a turquoise to a green, so you can barely see the gradient in this particular one. But there's always a gradient. It either goes horizontal or vertical. So I just pick two random colors. Um, and then, oh, this is some very specific stuff. I'm skipping that because it doesn't matter too much for you right now. Um, again, here's all my functions that I use over and over and over. Same stuff. I've got my blur, I've got my noise, I've got my levels, um, my, my blending modes, overlay screen, multiply, which I mean, those are almost like my nodes from substance, right? I mean, I use like, I use my blur, I use my noise, I use my levels. It's, it's the same stuff I was using over there which is my functions here. So, okay. So the first thing that happens in Sosfa is I just draw a line on a campus called X. Nobody judged my naming conventions, it's called X. So, um, me. Ooh. Comment all that out and... So it just draws a line, first of all. It's white on black, which is completely arbitrary. It could have been the other way around. Um, but to draw the line, I've chosen a baseline, which is like some percentage of the way down the screen. And then it chooses randomly when to go up and do a little loop to do, and then go back down. It always comes back down to the baseline at the end, and sometimes in the middle. Um, so I just choose a bunch of points for this complicated thing that I don't want to explain. And then I just draw the line. And the line is made up of, what is that, 20,000 little strokes that look like this. So if I make them a lot less, you can see them. If that thing will move so I can refresh it. You can see the little lines. So it's made up of 20,000 little lines so close to each other that they blend together and then they look like calligraphy stroke. So then I add on some blots, which are actually made in a shader to make them kind of like wobbly. In the shader, I just throw down a circle and then I just like warp it a little bit with noise. And then they're thrown into the top half of the screen only. So, um, do you have a question? Um, why, um, what, what inspired you to make this sort of line? Because it really looks to me like um, a calligraphy 
uh, typography kind of situation? Yeah. Oh, I forgot I was going to open my process. Actually, it's, it's a really good question. I didn't even intend it at first. Um, so it's a process. I didn't, I didn't start out thinking calligraphy line, right? Actually, I woke up like two in the morning one day when I was jet lagged and I was like, ooh, a line that had got blurred by water being thrown on it. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> so, and it was vertical in my mind. So I just drew a line and tried to make it look like water fell on mm -hmm. it. Which, I mean, okay, it, the, the idea of water messing up something goes way back for me. Like, with like the tie dye and the, a lot. Oh, remember the watercolor patterns that I made? Like this idea goes right. way back. So I was like, "Ooh, I'm gonna try it now with JavaScript." So I thought of a line going vertically, and it wasn't calligraphy. Mm -hmm. um, I kept messing with that, with that bleed, and then I tried making it like a brush stroke, and then I tried the calligraphy line, and I just loved it. You could say it was probably inspired by like Islamic calligraphy, mm -hmm. probably. I love Islamic calligraphy, so I don't know. Yeah, eventually I turned it on its side, made it go up from a line and added blots. At one point I actually animated it. So yeah, I mean, you should, if, if you want to know more details about that aspect of how I developed it, you should go read it here, my website slash sudfo dash process. Um, I'll share the link. I'll share the link right now on our Discord chat. It was like the process for me though. It's not like the process of the code, how it works. Yeah, it was probably very much inspired by Islamic calligraphy and like living in Saudi Arabia. Because, like, to me, calligraphy feels, like, so perfect and intentional and so noble. And then this piece, the idea is that something, water or juice, was just thrown on it. And it turned out to be beautiful. It turned out to be more beautiful. So, which I guess is kind I of a normal, like, you know, <laughs> I have kids and they make a mess. And it's just, like, frustrating. But it's beautiful, too, right? Like. Yeah, I love if uh, Martin Braxer was here with us again today, <laughs> because last week we were talking about, you know, typography and uh, how he, he sees like shapes and uh, meaning to to letters and what kind of meaning we give to letters and how we can, you know, reconstruct all of that. Um, and I find it very, very interesting whenever we kind of take something that's very much um, well known to us, like a sort of uh, calligraphy or a language, right? A system that we all know, and we we really like disrupt it and we have to make something all the way back, you know? We have to rebuild it completely. Um, so I love also the idea of creating a sort of language through through code. And um, it, it, almost, it almost looks like you were trying to write something um, and then there was some, chaotic <laughs> situation happening in the meantime. Yeah, actually like the, the idea where it goes back down to the baseline and then goes up and does something, it's very much like like somebody's writing in cursive. Actually, in all my thousands of outputs, it did happen that it wrote the <laughs> one time. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. I saved that one. <clears throat> but yeah, in general, they don't actually say anything, but yeah, they're very much like writing like calligraphy or like, like English cursive or like Arabic calligraphy. So let's see here. This part is actually the most important part of the whole thing, but I'm gonna come back to it. It was like preparing it ahead of time. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, No. 
Okay, you can't see that one, I guess. <laughs> okay, this one is a texture that is just a bunch of tiny little lines. Just little bloop, 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 thrown all over the place. And I'll, I'll add that in later. This one, ah, I'll show it. This one is my my kind of go to background texture. It's like streaky vertical and horizontal and then it's been warped. And I also added in a bunch of little speckles with noise. So I've made this canvas of texture and this canvas of texture and I have another canvas of the line. Um, I think that's nope nope there's one more canvas i've got like four or five different canvases lined up at this point. Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm, no, I'm not. Let's see. So my noises, so, okay. So I make another canvas now that is like the, the spill. Oh, yeah. Okay, so like for this one, uh, it's just circles. I just threw white circles on black. Um, I've got all these canvases lined up now in memory, and then I'm going to throw them all into this shader here. And unsurprisingly, I'm using, ooh, that's different, just a minute. I'm using um, variable blur like three times to make this. I'm gonna undo it. So the um, the 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 line has been brought in here. The dots have been brought in here. The textures have all brought, been brought in here. And what it does is first it blend or blurs the dots themselves. Let me see if I can remember how to show you that. Um. Let's see, that would be N, I think. To output N. I hope that works. Yes, although it has texture on it, which is probably not a good idea. Okay, so I've blurred the um, blurred the dots. Remember, I threw those those white dots around, and then I blurred those, and then I used those to blur my line, which I think is going to be this one. It's been a while, guys. Give me a second. Um, I think it's gonna take be your time. The audience actually is loving that you know you're you're showing us everything, <laughs> every full <laughs> step. I've got this console open here for a reason because I'm gonna make errors and I need to see them. I prepared for it. <laughs> Everybody does it. Everybody makes errors. So, Absolutely. um, let's see. I think it's B, right? Blur, blur. Yeah, it's gotta be B. Let's output B. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. So B does nothing when the um, 
when the spot of the original of the blurred dot image doesn't have anything. Ah, yeah, here, here's the nothing. If it's if it's if it's black, it does nothing. And then if it's anything lighter than that, it goes in and it blurs twice. So we have a blur that makes the spill. It's this guy right here. I'm gonna take out this one for a minute. So you get just the spill, but you've lost the line in that area. And then I have the other one, other blur, which does it just a lot less. Ooh, didn't like that. What do I do? I think that would work. Oh, 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 whoops. Okay. That's not going to work either. Okay, so this one just blurs it a lot less. So you get the line still there, just like it's been messed up by the water in that area. So I add those together and you end up with this. So actually there was a magic moment while I was working on this that was totally unexpected. I, I in the beginning I was working with a, um, hmm, I was working with a really, really good blur. This is my blur and it is completely obfuscated, which is frustrating. Let me go get my other blur. That and these as well. If this works, it's going to be a miracle. Ha! Okay, so you can see this has a lot less texture in it. Um, I was working with a really high quality blur. And this is like what I would have expected to, to do. But I, I was having performance troubles. It was taking a really, really long time to load on the Arflux thing, on the Arflux system. And it would kept giving me white thumbnails. So I was trying to optimize my code and make it go faster. So I changed these numbers down. It's something, it's something like three. I don't remember what the number is there. And when I changed it, I changed the quality. Just I kept going down and down and down and trying to see how low I could make it go. And I went all the way down to the number three. And then like, poof, all this amazing texture appeared. I was really, really, really shocked. But I totally kept it. I kept the credit too. <laughs> Even though it wasn't intentional. Um. Yeah, OK. Oh, so then the last bit of this is actually um, a gradient map. So I've gone into the midtones. I left white as white. No, sorry. I made white be black and I made black be white and anything in a midtone, I overlaid that gradient inside. And that's what this is doing. Um, actually, I'll just do that first. So we're almost there at that point. And then I actually applied levels to it. This is my levels function. I just like upped the blacks a little bit to get some more, some more definition in the spell. And then the last bit is to apply texture. So it's that same texture that I'm always using. I think it's just this. The last bit is only for the black and white output switch. Does it matter here? And there it is. Uh, this is beautiful. We have some amazing reaction from the audience as well. Um, so 
um, Rodrigo was saying, uh, simple as she makes it look like and transparent, yet complex and pure beauty. And we have some amazing comments here. People are really, really loving this. Um, Sabo said, it makes it, she makes it look so easy for her. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. This is this is really incredible. Um, can you show us the whole um, collection, like uh, like an overview of it, so we can see all together what? Um... Yeah, sure. Oh, they're small though. It's gonna be really hard to see. That's perfect, I think, yeah. Okay, there. Is that better? So for some of them, I, instead of throwing dots around, I threw lines and I used that as the spill and I blurred it and then used it to blur the line and everything. Some of them mm -hmm. I used the noise itself as the spill. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of cut it off at a certain level. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does, yeah, yeah, it does. Oh, good. Um, so we have uh, a question from Samuel said, uh, do you ever sketch before making your art or is it just um, from your imagination and inspiration? That's a good question. I you haven't have really, book. except for if I'm like logically stuck, if I'm like <laughs> trying to figure out the math of something. Oh, can't, oh, it's over here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll sketch it down really fast. But I don't usually sketch now. Hmm. All right. Um Jen say this has been so great. Shaders still a mystery though. And <laughs> and X function said, I'm also trying to work out the curved brush stroke. So I'm glad it's not just me <laughs> scratching my head. Um I love this. And then uh, Peter is sending some advice as well. It says, if you check the general club shader workshop I did last March, he can send it over. Send it over, Peter, so everyone can see it. Um, but this has been wonderful. I love to see um, how the, the community really loves and, and engages with this. Uh, I know that for some people, I know that a lot of people come from different types of art backgrounds. Um, so some things might be a little bit more difficult than others to understand. Um, but I'm, I'm honestly so, so impressed by, by your work. And also like the way you just presented it to us today, it's, it, you can see that you took a lot of time as well to prepare this. So really thank you so, so much for doing this. Um, it's really, it's really appreciated. I really love this. Um, I was going to ask you, what do you think after all these years, making uh, generative art and, you know, uh, code generated art in general. What do you think is the future of generative art? Where do you see this going in like next year or in five years? That's a really good question. <laughs> a really hard question. I mean, I have hopes. I hope generative art becomes like way more widespread and known and accepted. And I mean, we're already a lot more in that direction in the last couple of years, so yeah. I also hope that, um, you know, that people keep exploring and pushing the boundaries of what generative art can do, which I'm trying to do. Um, a lot, I think a lot of us are. So I think, I think we're just now starting to see like what we can do with generative art. And Absolutely. yeah, I'm excited to see. No. Yeah, totally. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing this type of classes is really to show and to, to bring more people to the general art space and um, also to kind of not be that scared about coding, you know? I feel like a lot of people might be um, a little intimidated, like, oh, I don't do maths or I don't do this and that. And so they might be a little uh, skeptical or, or just scared to try. And uh, yeah, I love it. It doesn't have that. to be this complicated. You can start, it can be like just a couple lines of code can start making cool things and you might be surprised it's a lot easier than you think in the beginning actually so. mm -hmm. yeah and what you share with us today it's a lot of you know incredible tips as well from the software that you showed us today for like you can you can start with that and you can make your own um 
your own images and, and then bring it to code after. I see there's a lot of reactions again. Everyone is super happy. Super cool presentation, Melissa. Uh, really like seeing you demonstrate your process. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you putting up the space. That's awesome. I'm so happy everyone loved it. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, and also, yeah, again, thank you so, so much, Melissa. It's been wonderful. We are perfectly on time. <laughs> so this has been great. I feel like we've learned really so much. And what I really love about your work is that you can really see new perspectives and new way of working with codes that it's not as as usual as you will see in the, not just in the energy space, but generally in generative art. I feel like you really are trying to to bring new views and new um, approaches to it. So uh, I, it's really been an honor for me to listen to you today, learn about you, your inspirations and, uh, and do your work. So thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks again, Leticia as well. And Joe, were you with me? Um, I know you've been both busy, so <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. And thanks again, everyone who was in the audience. Uh, please send us some reactions. Okay, everyone, have a great day or evening, uh, depending where you are. And uh, see you soon. Thank you for listening to the AOI streams. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a like and subscribe to listen to more stories from the pioneers of the ecosystem.